Kia ora tatu. My name is Caroline McQuarrie and I'm making this video talk in lieu of an in-person floor talk at Hastings Art Gallery in February 2022 to coincide with the exhibition Prospects Fearful made by myself and Sean Matthews which is on at the Hastings Art Gallery until 22nd of March 2022. In this talk I'll tell you some of the background behind the exhibition a little of the original history that it is based on and some aspects of the process of making the exhibition. Prospects Fearful is a co-exhibition by myself and Sean Matthews, which opened initially in September 2018 at the Suta Art Gallery Te Aratoi o Whakatū in Nelson. It has since also been shown in both Greymouth and Hokitika in the South Island. We were absolutely thrilled to bring the work to Hastings at the end of last year for its first showing in the North Island. The exhibition is about the expedition made between 1846 and 1848 by Thomas Brunner with guides Kehu, Pikiwati and their wives from Nelson into Tetai Potani, the West Coast region and back again. Comprising three separate but related bodies of work, the exhibition is made up of large photographic banners printed onto polyester fabric through dye sublimation printing, embroideries which were hand-stitched on linen, referring to the form of embroidered samplers from the European tradition, and hand-woven harakiki pararai, or sandals, from the Māori tradition. There is also a folio style publication which is available from Hastings Art Gallery which has images of all the works, an introduction written by Sean and myself and an essay by Wellington writer Jessica Hubbard. Thomas Brunner was only 25 years old in 1846 when he, his guides Kehu and Pekawati, along with their wives, whose names we unfortunately don't know, set off towards Lake Rotoiti to start their journey. Brunner was a surveyor who had come to the fledgling colony of New Zealand as a young man. The New Zealand company, who had set up the township of Nelson, offered payment for the discovery of parcels of land which would be suitable for settlement. Brunner had been as far south as Mafera, now Greymouth, earlier that year with Hefe and Fox, also with Kehu as their guide. The young men had heard tales of large swathes of flat, farmable land and were keen to find it and claim it for the Nelson Provincial Government on behalf of the New Zealand Company. Because Brunner wanted to explore between Lake Rotuiti and the west coast, the obvious route was to travel the length of the Kawatiri, now the Buller River. Many people will know the main facts of this story. The party struck a particularly rainy season and struggled to find food all the way down the river. They could not catch eels to eat as the river was continually in flood. They turned back often to attempt to find food, usually without much luck. By the time they reached the coast, they were so hungry that they fell upon seaweed to eat. Travelling south, they stayed with local Māori at Mafeta, which is now Greymouth, at the Taramako, Arahura and Okarito. Brana got as far south as Paringa, which is about halfway between Haast and Fox Glacier. He only turned Brat back due to a sprained ankle. Travelling back northwards, he was taken on side excursions to Lake Kaneri and on the way home up the Mafeta, now the Grey River, to Kotuku Whakaaho, known now as Lake Brunner. While travelling back to Nelson, Brunner suffered a serious stroke, leaving him unable to use one side of his body for a time. Nursed back to health and then supported to walk by Guide Kehu and his wife, Brunner eventually made it back home 550 days after he had left. Sean Matthews and I are both exhibiting artists with a shared expertise in photography. We are both interested in how photography can be used in an exploratory and experimental way. We conceived of this project to work on collaboratively in the summer of 2011-2012. We were attracted both by the story and by the fact that we were already driving between Picton and Greymouth multiple times a year to visit my family and for me to photograph other projects. 
We started making a few photographs each trip and slowly the project grew. While working on this project, it started to bother us that our previous understanding of Brunner's trip had painted him as an explorer. Yet his guides knew the route that the party were taking so well in fact that they actually did not want to travel the length of the Kawateri and only did so on Brunner's insistence. As we read Brunner's published journal, we were initially struck by the way in the early stages he really rubbed up against his Māori companions. He did not want the guides' wives to travel with them. He doesn't like that the wives wander off into the bush and the party has to wait until they come back. He constantly complains of the slow speed that they travel. Yet as the trip progresses, Brana slowly starts to get into the rhythms of Māori life. He slows down to their pace. He learns some of their skills. Brana's reliance on Māori forced him to begin to understand himself in relation to them, not the other way around. Brana became, towards the end of his trip at least, perhaps truly Pākehā, a white New Zealander defined by their relationship to Māori. Hilary Mantel, author of the novels Wolf Hall and Bringing Up the Bodies about the real Thomas Cromwell, suggested in her 2017 BBC Wreath lecture that an engagement with history through art can bring us closer to it, can make it more alive. And I quote her, St. Augustine says, the dead are invisible, they are not absent. You needn't believe in ghosts to believe that's true. We carry the genes and the culture of our ancestors, and what we think about them shapes what we think of ourselves and how we make sense of our time and place. Are these good times, bad times, interesting times? We rely on history to tell us. History and science help us put our small lives in context. But if we want to meet the dead looking alive, we turn to art. End quote. But what lens are we to re-examine our history with? We are a colonial country, and as Pākehā, our ancestors were the colonisers. Te Rumoana Cave on the coast between Punakaiki and Westport was a traditional stopping point for Māori travelling between the Nelson Tasman region and the west coast. For hundreds of years it sheltered them on an unforgiving piece of coastline. Yet in less than 20 years after Kehu and Pikawati um, took Brunner to this place, this part of the coast would be swarming with Europeans hunting for gold. Just behind this cave was perhaps the West Coast's most boom and bust gold town, Brighton, sprang up and then fell away in less than 40 years. Prior to making Prospects Fearful, I made a number of projects about the history of the West Coast region, including the exhibition No Town, which was an examination of extant mining towns, incorporating photographs of the sites now alongside my embroideries depicting elements of life in the towns as they were. And this is um, just a few of the images from that series which uh, depicts the aforementioned Brighton. However, I was aware that while making these projects that I was presenting a story which seemed as though the European settlers had colonised the West Coast during the gold rush and had just come to empty land. However, I knew from my research how intertwined the stories of Māori and settler were in those early years. They had to be. Without Māori, those early surveys and prospectors would not have survived the harsh conditions. Brunner had the confidence of a young, white, 19th century gentleman. If he wanted to stride off into the mountains, why shouldn't he? Yet as he travelled deep into the southern parts of Te Tai Poutini, one chief he is travelling with admits that he is happy to have Brunner turn around and go home because he is concerned that if Brunner dies as a European travelling um, by himself with Māori, they will be blamed. It has not occurred to the privileged Brunner that his solitary presence there puts his hosts in danger. It would be easy for us now to criticise Brunner for his colonising ways. His worldview would have meant that he saw Māori as other and his attitude towards the land is to assess what can be taken from it. Yet rejecting him outright seems no better than embracing him wholeheartedly. I was struck when I contacted iwi historians on the west coast that when I asked for information about the people Brunner met on his journey, I was directed back to Brunner's own journal. Sadly many oral histories have been lost. 
This is not to say that Brunner and those like him were justified in what they did, or that they heroically saved Māori histories, but simply that looking backward is complicated and interwoven, that once two peoples meet, their stories cannot be separated from one another, which mean that, means that to understand ourselves as Pākehā, we need to do that in relation to Māori. There are three distinct sections to this exhibition. The main body is 14 large double-sided dye sublimation prints on polyester pongee fabric. The images are pinhole photographs of the landscape that the party would have moved through. This was not intended to be a following in the footsteps exercise. Rather, we wanted to help the viewer feel what it might be like to be inside those landscapes as they were then. We made sure to include images of the bush, the coast and various lakes and waterways the party travelled to or down. The earlier image I showed you of Te Moana Cave is the only site that we photographed where we knew the exact spot the party had been. Otherwise the photographs are of areas that we knew that they passed through. We spend a great deal of time reading Brunner's journals and taking note of the places that he mentioned, then working out if firstly we could reach the same place, and secondly if it would bear any resemblance now to how it looked then. Teitai Putini in the 1840s was almost entirely covered in forest, much of which has been cleared now. We also tried to avoid, avoid photographing any introduced vegetation. We shot photographs for this exhibition over five years, travelling the route a couple of times a year. Sometimes we would travel to a spot we thought would be perfect only to find that it wasn't going to work at all. In between trips we would assess what we had and plan further excursions for the next trip. The camera we shot the photographs on is a wooden pinhole camera manufactured in Hong Kong. It is designed to use 5 by 4 inch sheet film which would be loaded one shot at a time. However, we converted the camera slightly by using a rollback attachment, which meant that we could shoot on medium format 120 film. The format of the medium format back we selected was 6 by 12 centimetres, a long, almost panoramic shape, and exactly the shape of the images that you see in the exhibition. This gave us only six photos per roll of film, so we had to be sure that we were getting the photo that we wanted. This is the part of the exhibition that we created most collaboratively. Because the pinhole camera doesn't have a viewfinder, we would only have an approximation of what the finished composition would be. This enables us to discuss the direction, angle and placement of the camera together. We've always had a similar photographic eye and making these photographs together was an enjoyable experience. Pinhole cameras can be any focal length that you would like to make them, but they have their most pinhole-like characteristics when they are very wide angle. Using the 6x12 format meant we took very wide angle photographs, and you can see this in the way the image starts to stretch and darken at the edges where less light hits the film. The next slide is the result of the photo that I was taking here. You can see what a wide view of the scene the pinhole camera captured. The other characteristic of pinhole photos is that because the aperture of the camera, the actual pinhole, is so small, the resulting photographs have unlimited depth of field. This means that everything in the photo has the same level of focus, whether it is very close to the camera or a long way away from it. Although because the pinhole camera doesn't have a lens, just a small hole that gets uncovered and then recovered to make the exposure, the photos are not as sharp generally as a normal camera. Because the pinhole aperture is so small, longer exposure times are needed in order to let in enough light to expose the film correctly. On a sunny day, our exposures might be a couple of seconds, as opposed to something like 1 250th of a second normally. But on an overcast day like this one, the exposure might have stretched to a couple of minutes. You can see blur in this photo where the tree branches have moved during the exposure. When we return to Wellington, we would have the film processed and then we would scan it to make digital files. In Photoshop, over top of these photographs, Sean digitally overlaid different elements to create texture and the dark greenish look that all the photos have. 
He would use other digital photos that he had taken at the sites, along with scans of paper that he had stained with black tea and juice made from native plants. He particularly chose to use tea because at a certain point in his diary, Brunner mentions that he's run out of tea and laments that he has finally left his European life behind. Most of the final images have around 8 to 14 layers, sometimes often only affecting a small area of the image. It is important to note that we did not use Photoshop to alter the integrity of what was photographed, simply the colour and tonal values of the images, and to add um, a lot of the texture that the images have. This slide shows the original scan on the left, with the pinhole characteristics of the image fall off top and bottom, movement blur in the water and sky, and the unlimited depth of field, showing the same focus in the rocks at the foreground, and the rocks uh, down the coast in the, in the background. While the final image on the right shows Sean's overlaid alterations after a great deal of work in Photoshop. Our intention was to suggest the feeling of 19th century paintings, which would have been Brunner's understanding of landscape art, the sublime, something either to be in awe of or to claim dominion over or perhaps both at once to prove one's own greatness. We were particularly influenced by painter Pietrus van der Velden, who painted very brooding landscapes in the mountains of the Southern Alps in the 1890s. Hung from the ceiling, nine of these prints are arranged so that they flow across the room. This was to create the feeling of a journey, of walking through the bush uh, alongside the party. Printed double-sided, the viewer can walk around the works and have the image equally rich on both sides. Double printing also gave the colour, particularly the blacks, an intensity which pointed to the darkness of some of the situations that the party found themselves in. We had worked with printing on fabric in a number of other projects that we had made individually. Our experience with dye sublimation printing coming mostly through two projects that Sean made in 2017 and 2018. Water Reflects Light was work made of part of, as part of the Upstream Arts Trail in Central Park in Wellington in 2017. Layering photographs taken in the park, Sean had them printed onto a durable fabric designed for outdoor flags and hung them back in the park. In 2018, he extended this technique in a project that uh, he made for Wellington City Council designed to educate people around invasive weeds in both their own gardens and local reserves. In Incursion, Sean photographed and scanned invasive climbing weeds and made large banners which hung in the Wellington Botanic Gardens, Otari Wooten's Bush, Mount Victoria and at Te Papa. These were accompanied by postcards which could be taken away with educational information about the plants. We also tested printing the works for Prospect Fearful on fabric at an exhibition titled Where the River Bends, which was at Island Gallery in, uh, at the Canterbury University in 2017. We were happy with the printing method, but we wanted to develop how we would hang the work further, and we ended up coming up with a method which used dark stained wooden battens with brass fastenings, suggesting a 19th century aesthetic. As can be seen in this video from the installation at the Souter Gallery in Nelson, perhaps the most gratifying aspect of the prints being on fabric is the way that they move. At the Souter, the gallery's air conditioning constantly created a gentle flow of air, the works flowing and undulating like water. And the same thing happens when people walk past the work. The Ponji fabric has just the right combination of lightness, which allows it to move, and density, which meant that some light comes through it, but it doesn't obliterate the image. We hope that the overall effect of something like moving through a forest shifting in the wind, that it has an experiential aspect to it, rather than just being something to be looked at. There are also five pinhole prints uh, hung against the walls of the gallery, each of which has the addition of a name written onto the image. One of the difficulties with Brunner's journal is that he does not spell Māori names well, either people or places, and he doesn't give tribal affiliations in the way that we would today. 
We perhaps shouldn't be too hard on Brunner for this, as Māori was at that stage, in the mid-1840s, only beginning to be a written language. But it was important to us to acknowledge at least some of the Māori Brunner travelled and stayed with. This often gets told as Brunner's story, but five people made the journey, and many more hosted them. And while it's not our job as Pākehā artists to uh, tell the story of the Māori involved in this, we can, as far as we can be sure, give their full names and tribal affiliations to um, guide Hone Mokehakeha, known as Kehu, uh, the other guide, Pikawati, and two of the rangatira the party encountered on their journey, Mahuika, who was based at the Kawatiri, which is now Westport, and Tohuru, who lived between Mafera, now Greymouth, and Okarito. Paul Madrick, a Potini Ngaitahu historian based in Greymouth, suggested that we identified these two particularly, as they both still have descendants living in Teitai Potini. It's important to note that the guide Kehu was a close friend of Brunner's, perhaps because of this journey. He had guided him on several previous expeditions and continued to guide him afterwards, even for a time living in Brunner's house with him. So it's clear that the two became friends. Sadly, we do not know the names of the guide's wives. Brunner never names them in his journal and research since has not been able to identify them, although a number of historians have searched. I was initially quite angry with Brunner for this. As a young, privileged, adventure-seeking white man, I felt he put no value on the two older women whose scratching about in the bush probably kept him alive. However, on reflection, I wonder whether he may not have named them in print because they were both escaped mokai or slaves. He describes later in the journey the guide's reluctance to travel across the Alps to Canterbury for fear of the women being recaptured. We cannot know the reason for this admission, but we hope to at least acknowledge the, these women here. The second element of the exhibition is 12 embroideries designed to emulate the sampler form depicting text and map from Brunner's journal. The title of the exhibition comes from one of the most famous entries in Brunner's journal. Written on a day when he seems to have given up hope of ever making it out of the bush, the entry reads, Rain continuing, dietary shorter, strength decreasing, spirits failing, prospects fearful. The title refers, of course, to the difficulties of the journey, but could also with hindsight be applied to the Māori communities that Brunner relied on to make the journey. Twelve years after this trip, in 1860, nearly three million acres of the west coast of the South Island was purchased, except for around 10,000 acres of reserves in the Arahura deed for £300, despite the chiefs having originally asked for £2,500 payment. Stitched with Danish flower cotton embroidery threads on linen, these cross-stitch embroideries were very labour-intensive to construct. They serve two purposes within the exhibition. Firstly, they represent some of the labour put into the journey itself. Each embroidery took me approximately 30 hours to stitch, let alone designing the patterns and finishing the work to make it ready to hang. After selecting the passages from Brunner's journal we wanted, that we wanted to include, I hand drew the patterns for the embroideries on A3 graph paper. Using an alphabet font that I designed based on embroidered samplers from the 19th century, I wanted the finished works to emulate the printed page. As such, I decided that the text should be justified, which means that it should have a straight edge on both the left and the right side of the text. This took some time and mathematical work to get the spacing between the words correct. I eventually gathered the drawings together into a folio and entered it into the 2019 Park and Drawing Prize, where it won a highly commended award. The collection of drawings is now part of the Suter Gallery's collection, along with the embroideries themselves. The second purpose of the embroideries was to provide a taste of the mannered, tightly controlled Victorian lifestyle that Brunner left behind and ultimately returned to. While he was not at the time married, any woman of Brunner's acquaintance would have been proficient with a needle, and it is likely that he grew up surrounded by such work. 
Juxtaposed with these, in the centre of the room, are 18 paraidai, or sandals, made from harakeki flax, and te kauka, which is cabbage tree. This element of the exhibition ties the other two elements together. There are 18 paraidai because the journey lasted for 18 months. The paraidai are made by myself. They are symbolic of the world that Brunner travelled into and found a way of fitting himself in with over time. These were an attempt to feel into the help that Brunner received, particularly in the literal support of the paraidai that Brunner made and used once his boots rotted away, which he describes in his journal. 21st of October 1847. I had often looked forward with dread to the time when my shoes would be worn out, often fearing I should be left a barefooted cripple in some desolate black birch forest or on this deserted coast. But now I can trudge along merrily barefoot or with a pair of native sandals called by the native parairai, made of the flax, leaves of the flax or what is more durable, the leaves of the tea or flax tree. I can make a sure footing in crossing rivers or ascending or descending precipices. In fact, I feel I am just beginning to make exploring easy work. A good pair of sandals will last about two days hard work and they only take about 20 minutes to make. Although I have to say I never got so quick at them that they only took me 20 minutes. Just like the guiding and the hospitality of locals he stayed with along the way, the Paraidae make made Brunner's journey possible. They are a symbol of his vulnerability and his need to take on the support and partnership of Māori in order to survive and to do his job. My learning to craft Paraidae is a repetition of Brunner's learning, a symbol of his coming to understand the world that he travelled in and to move according to its rhythms. In my quest to improve my harakiki weaving skills after trying by myself with limited success, through a connection I found local weaving group Te Rupu Raranga o Manaya. Meeting every Thursday evening and then once a month for a weekend noho, the group is affiliated with the Wellington Tenths Trust. Made up of a mix of both Māori and Pākehā men and women, although predominantly women, Manaya is a place where like-minded individuals get together and share knowledge and skills. This group with a passion for harakiki weaving of all kinds welcomed me warmly. For me, weaving has been an an experiential way into Māori culture in a similar way that it must have been for Brunner. Through the experience of making, through generous sharing of skills and time, my weaving improved greatly, although I still have a very long way to go. Looking back to the past, we see Brunner slowly stop commenting on the speed of his party. By the time they begin returning home to Nelson, he is fully part of the rhythm of their movements. He understands when they will stop to hunt weka or dig for fern root and when they will move forward. While he is pleased to be returning home, through spending time in the Māori world, he has come to understand something of it. Our hope in representing the story from the early part of Aotearoa New Zealand's colonial history, which has been told many times over the years, is that those who encounter the work begin to consider this story and other stories that we know about ourselves in a different light. If Brunner wasn't, as he's been usually painted, so much as an explorer, as someone who was generously guided and hosted by people who's under the understanding of the land he could never reach, then what other narratives might have a different side to them? Sean and I both continue to make new projects. Sean is currently working on a photographic project exploring the forest floor and the abundance of life that happens there, while I continue my interest in colonial settler historical narratives, utilising both photography and textiles. If you would like to follow our future projects, the best way to do that is to follow us on Instagram or check out our websites, which you can see here. Thank you for your kind attention through this talk, and I hope that you've enjoyed it. Ngā mihi.